All right, here we go. Freeway mm. Ricky Ross, welcome back. What's up? What's up, man? Third time. Third time? Third time. It's a charm, huh? Yeah. You look extra, <laughs> extra fly today. You know, you had your stylist come in with you today. Well, you know, we moving up a little bit in life, you know, and uh, when people felt that it was time that I start dressing up a little bit, I really like to, to dress down and I just feel more comfortable, you know, and, and wearing secondhand clothes. Yeah. <laughs> I feel you. I'm the same way. I'm the same way. Yeah. Um, well, you have a new project coming out, right? A bunch Maybe. Of, bunch of new projects. Bunch of new projects? Yeah. You don't want to talk about them yet? I mean, we can talk about everything. Huh? I mean, okay. Well, what are some of the new projects? Uh, well, the movie, we signed a director. Uh, we got the casting director signed. Uh, we also working on the TV series. Okay. Uh, I'm building an app for marijuana. Um, a new book coming out. Uh, January, my birth date. I'm releasing a new book. Um, man, I'm all over the place, man. I'm just, 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 you know, enjoying life, having a ball, you know. Hustling. <laughs> Doing what I like well, to legally, do. Hustle. Hu legally hustling. Legal hustling. Legal man. hustling. That's what's up, man. Switched it up. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, you know when, when, what I figured out when I was in jail that the only thing I was doing wrong was I put cocaine in my mix. Mm. You know, I, I should have left the cocaine out and just stayed with the baking soda. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. So, you know, we talked about a lot of stuff last couple of interviews. There's a few things that I kind of want to go over uh, um, that we didn't cover. Uh, one of which was what happened to you when you were five years old. Um, I guess you actually witnessed your mom shoot and kill your uncle? Yeah, yeah. And he could have been considered my favorite uncle or my second to the favorite uncle. Uh, uh, but um, he was close to me and I was close to him. What was that situation about? I mean, do you, obviously you were young, but you know, did you find oh, out? Oh, yeah, I remember. I was, you know, it was like it happened yesterday almost. You know? Okay. Uh, there's some things in life that you just don't forget. You know, uh, that was one of them. It was another situation when I was... Uh, uh, First or second day of school, you know, somebody beat me out my quarter for lunch. You know, those situations, you just never forget them. Uh -huh. And uh, the night that uh, my mom uh, shot my uncle, uh, you know, it, I'll never forget that. You know, that is something that I, I feel uh, will be with me for the rest of my life because it affected me. Um, it affected me in a way that I'd never been affected before, especially at that time. Okay. Well, what led up to the shooting? Uh, well, we came home, me and my mom, uh, not sure where we came from, but uh, we came into the house and uh, when we came in, uh, my uncle was literally stabbing his wife as we walked in the door. He was stabbing his wife? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, Just a domestic argument that, that went haywire? Or? Probably so. I mean, my uncle was a, was a, was a, was a, was a, a drunk, an alcoholic. Okay. Um, I don't know which one at the time, but, you know, he got drunk a lot. Um, and his wife was a sweet lady, you know, didn't go anywhere, stayed at the house all the time. And um, he felt that she had been messing with somebody else. But anyway, when we came in, my mom rushed right over to to pull him off of her. Uh, he probably would have killed her had my mom not been there. Um, but she was able to get her him off of her. And then in the middle of that, she stepped in between the two of them and um, told him to back up. But this also was the same brother that had knocked out my mom's eye. Really? So your uncle had actually put hands on your mother yeah. previously? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there was a, a history of violence between the two of them? Uh, I don't know if it was violence between them, but uh, that incident had happened. Okay. Uh, um, did you see that when it happened? No, I didn't see that. Okay. I just knew, you know, from talking to her and, and, and uh, hearing other people talk about it, that that was uh, the situation. Okay. So she got in between them, and then what happened? Well, we were able to get out of the house from there. My mom and, and, and my auntie, my mom wrapped my auntie up, and uh, we were able to get in the cab and, and, and take off. We hid at, at uh, one of my mom's cousin's house, um, and he came there. It's in the book. Okay. <laughs> this whole story is in the book. Okay. How we hid, and uh, he came to my cousin's house, um, and we hid outside on the ledge of the window uh, when he came in and searched the house so he didn't find us. And then eventually we went to my mom's boyfriend's house. 
which is where uh, my mom killed him at. Uh, we were hiding in, in his garage. It was a makeshift house that was made, a garage was made out of a, a little house. And uh, my uncle kicked the door in. And uh, when he kicked the door in, my mom pulled a pistol out and told him, uh, don't come no closer. And, uh, you know, one shot and, and, and it killed him. And you actually saw it? I, not only did I see it, but I also stepped over him because he had cornered us. Uh, he, had, he had like a little kitchen section. And so we were kind of like cornered in a kitchen with, with no exit. Uh, the only way out was through the door that he came in. It was a very small room. Uh, 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 and I had to step over him and I could hear him gasping for air, not knowing at that time that he was gonna die because I didn't even know what dying was. Uh, um, Where did he get hit? I don't, I don't okay. know, yeah. I don't know. Um, they took me right out, uh, took me inside of the main house and um, you know, the police came and, and took my mom away and um, okay. that was the last I knew about it. Was, was she basically, you know, did she get off with self-defense at that point? Or? I, I believe that she did, yeah. Okay, I believe so she, she did. never went uh, She stayed jail. a few few weeks in jail. Okay, while well, they figured out right, what, what was what, happening. What took place, I guess. Well, clearly with his wife being stabbed up and you guys running away and him pursuing, seems like a straightforward situation. Yeah, I think so. I think I think it was it should have been pretty easy for, for the cops to, to figure out. Uh, but, you know, that was during the 60s. It was a lot going on. This was during the Watch Riot uh, 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 time, and, and it was just so much going on at that time uh, that I don't know what exactly took place, how the, the, the court system went. Uh, um, I never went to the jailhouse to visit her. Um, it, it really was, for me, it was really a strange time because we hadn't been out here that long, and she was the only person that I had out here. So now I was basically uh, being kept by uh, her boyfriend's mother, okay. which for me was uh, uh, um, a strange time and, and, and a strange situation, you know, to be with people that I really didn't know uh, um, and my mom to be gone. How did that affect your mom, first of all, <clears throat> to, to kill her own brother? Granted, I, it was, it was self-defense and it was justified, but... We never, you know, we never talked about that. Never talked about uh, that. Uh, none of the family ever talked about it. It was almost like, uh, um, I don't know, a taboo, I guess, to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, the only time me and her ever mentioned it is when I got ready to write my book and I explained to her that I wanted to put it in the book. Would it be okay with her? And uh, could she handle it? And, and she was like, uh, because I, I respect, you know, that, yeah. that some people may not be able to deal with something, that, you know, of, of that magnitude. But she said she was good with it and, and, and that's the reason I put it in the book. How did it affect you to see a murder happen right in front of you? Well, it, it, it taught me the importance of life, you know. Uh, a lot of times when uh, I was in a position to have to decide if somebody should live or die, uh, um, I was able to make the right decision. As you kind of progressed with your, with your career and so forth, when people ripped you off, you know, the standard way to deal with these things is murder. In, in that drug game, but you never did that. No, nah, no, nah, because I, I understood, uh, well, you know, I understood that from multiple levels. You know, I, I was uh, fortunate for me that when I started selling drugs, I had become a critical thinker, you know, uh, and, and, and I really didn't understand that until a couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, I got a couple babies that play tennis and uh, I, I, I started letting them get coached by one of my old teammates. and. Uh, he, he invited us up to UCLA for a camp, and the, uh, the, the coach from UCLA was speaking to a group of kids, and he was saying that in tennis, you're making 60,000 decisions every tennis match, I believe, if, if mm -hmm. I may be quoting the numbers wrong. But anyway, there was a high number of decisions that have to be made at any given time. And um, what that told me was that from playing tennis, making those decisions every single day uh, uh, turn you into what uh, uh, is known as a critical thinker. And I was able to weigh decisions out quickly and, 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 and make decisions that a lot of people can't make, uh, saying that 
um, you know, there was incidents where people owed us money and, you know, um, say for instance, like one time uh, one of our suppliers had uh, hooked up a deal and then we wind up getting cake mix. Yeah, I think you mentioned that in our first interview. Yeah, like yep. $70,000 worth of cake mix. Right. So I'm chasing a guy who, who got my money in the car. So when, when I get back to where the guy was who was setting up the deal, my guy's in beat him to a pulp. He's bloody and he's covered and, and um, they thinking about killing him. And, and you know, I had to come to terms uh, with, with them and, and convince them that uh, uh, we couldn't kill him. You know, that it, it wasn't, uh, first of all, I didn't believe that he was involved in the ripoff and uh, the other thing of how much it would cost us uh, if we killed him. So you mentioned you were there with your mother and her boyfriend. Where was your father during this whole time? Uh, my father was living in Texas. Okay. Were you, were your parents married or no? They were married uh, uh, before, um, well, they, they, they separated when I was four months old. So I never lived with my father. Well, for four months, probably, I probably lived with my father. Okay. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't have a relationship. Uh, we didn't, uh, you know, we, we, we just didn't, we didn't have a relationship. You know, there was no father-son. Okay. The whole time to this day? Yeah. I think uh, I spent one week with him um, uh, when I got out in uh 93, I think I spent one week with him. And that's it? Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, I had never spent time with him. I didn't know him. But I did kind of want to know a little bit about him. Uh, um, and I was glad I did spend that time with him. He passed while I was in prison. Huh. Um, but I found out, you know, that he was a hustler. Um, and then from, from the LA Time article, I found out that he used to be a bootlegger. Huh. So we kind of practiced similar trades in, in, yeah. in some forms. Uh, but but he was he was a definitely a hard worker. Uh, he didn't mind working, um, and you know we had a few things in common. You know, a lot of times when, when I talk to people who who end up getting involved in the streets, you know, they say it's because they didn't have a father around, and the the OG in the neighborhood became the father figure in a way. You know, do you think that if you had a a father in your life the whole time, that you might have chosen a different path? Uh, it's hard to say uh, um, if a father would have made a difference. Uh, my thing was more economics, you know. Uh, it wouldn't have mattered if my father would have been there if he wouldn't have been able to show me how to uh, uh, strive economically. I think I probably would have wound up in the same position uh, because um, as long as I can remember, I wanted money. Right. You know, since I was... I don't know, four or five years old, you know, I used to hustle bottles, uh, even though I didn't know what to do with the money at that time, I would go make the money and go buy candy and tater chips. But at the same time, I knew that you needed money to buy potato chips and candy and sodas. And, and, and that's what I was going to do to get that because my mom uh, didn't give me the money to, to get it. Yeah. And today you have eight children. Yeah, eight children, and I think I got 13 or 14 grandkids. Wow. And it seems like you're involved in their lives. I try to be. I try yeah. to be. If they let me, uh, I, I'm, uh, I want to be a part. But, you know, I have, I have one daughter who doesn't want me in her life, you know. I mean, but we cool. You know, if she yes. needs if she, her car go to the impound or the repo people get it, <laughs> she called me and, hey, Dad, I need $300 <laughs> a kick in. <laughs> <laughs> and I go to scrounging to make sure that uh, that yeah. I can help her whenever, uh, uh, whenever I can. Uh, what what I want to do with my kids is, is really just give them opportunities, uh, uh, afford them the opportunities, and and uh, um, the insight to do whatever it is they want to do. You know, I, I understand that uh, everybody don't want what I want, and everybody shouldn't want what I want. Right. Uh, and and I try not to impress my will on others, you know, uh, because then you become a dictator. Uh, yep. and, and I don't want to be a dictator. I, I just want to uh, enjoy life, you know, and, and keep breathing. So, you know, you've always talked about playing tennis. 
when you were younger. Mm. Um, well, you know, Tennessee me. Yeah. But, you know, were, were you ever around? Well, I guess Venus and Serena were a lot younger than I you. I was around Venus and Serena. You were around Venus and Serena. And, and her father, their father. I know their father. Okay. I know both. I know. I, uh, I uh, remember when, uh, I think when I met them, we all should go to tournaments together. My kids, my older kids, and Venus and Serena uh, uh, played the same tournaments. My okay. nephew, uh, my nephew still works out. I think with. Okay, with, I don't with, think your kids won those tournaments. <laughs> <laughs> Venus and Serena. At that were time, they, at that time, <laughs> at that time, they probably could have beat Venus and Serena. Oh really? My kids were good. You okay. know, I had a, I had a son that was ranked four in California. He was eight. He was ranked four in the ten and under. Okay. And I had one. They were twins, and the other one. One was ranked four, one was ranked eight. I had a nephew that was number one in the, uh, in the 12 and unders. So, okay. So he definitely would have beat him at that time. Okay. Uh, he's the one that still works out, I think, with Serena. Once oh, really? Time. Yeah. Okay, so you saw that whole phenomenon kind of come together. Well, he, he, Richard kind of took my idea. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, well, you, you know, when Richard started, uh, when, when Richard started, Richard didn't really know much about tennis. Okay. Um, when, when I met him, I knew more about tennis at that time than he did. He, he became a, a tennis guru, but he wasn't a tennis guru at first, which he admits that I, I, I see in a couple of interviews uh, that he did, and he was talking about how he went and got books, and you know, he really studied the game. Uh, but when, when we met him, uh, he didn't have the, uh, the, the tennis background you know, that you would think he would have needed to, uh, to get Venus and Serena where he got him. Right, because I, I remember hearing stories how he would have to pay like gang members to kind of guard the courts while they were practicing because they were living in Compton, right? Right, right. Well, they stayed in, they stayed in a pretty bad area. Yeah. Um, I, I played on those two tennis courts where, uh, where I heard they, 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 they played at most of the time. Uh, but I don't know about the guard and the tennis courts and all that. <laughs> um, highly possible, you know, but uh, unlikely as for... In my personal opinion, you know. Fair uh, enough. Fair enough. Our park was pretty rough too, but uh, you didn't need, you know, they didn't come over to the tennis courts and, and gang bang on, you know, yeah. on little boys or, or, or anything like that there. But, uh, you know, our neighborhood can be dangerous. You know, you can get a straight bullet or something. Yeah. You know, and Serena went on. Well, I mean, both of them went on to be phenomenal with Serena. Phenomenal. Being like, the best female player of all time, I think. Yeah, I think I think Serena is the best uh, right yeah. now, ranked the best female player of all times. Which and she's my daughter's idol, you know, my little mm. daughter. She idolizes Serena. She plays with Serena's rackets. Um, mm. Next time Serena's in town, I'm going to take her out so she can meet and take a picture with Serena. Help. Um, and hopefully she'll be Serena's records. That's what's up. So, at 18, you had a, a chop shot. Yep. Was this before the, the drug dealing or no? Yeah, it was before the drug dealing. Okay, so before you got into drugs, you were stealing cars, I guess? Yep. It went, it went uh, really the cars introduced me to the, to the drug business. Okay. So, so you had, I guess, a chop shop big enough to hold 20 cars? Mm, I don't know. It, it held quite a few cars. Uh, 20, maybe, maybe 20 cars. You know, we used to crowd them in there, and then we had like a little driveway too. Uh, where we put them, because we were painting cars as well. We did paint and body work, so we wasn't just chopping cars. Okay. So at 18, you had a full-fledged business, like a semi-legal, <laughs> I guess, business. Yeah, I mean, I, I got into that almost the same way I, I do everything else, you know. Uh, uh, my guys took me to, to, to Church's Chicken one night, you know, I never, and, and it's crazy, I lived in L.A. and I had never no, noticed lowriders. Hmm. You know, uh, that's more of a Mexican thing back then. No, no, blacks were heavy in it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, blacks but, but, were heavy. But, but, but didn't they get it from the Mexican culture? I don't know. Because okay. uh, we had some old lowriders. You know, we had Ethan, we had uh, um, Ernest, Doghouse, you know, rest in peace, was a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, Hancho, you know, it was guys that had been low riding. Terry Carter, you know, mm. those guys had been low riding for years. Yeah, rest in peace. Uh, rest in peace, Terry. Uh, so those guys, had, Terry Cadeau, you know, th these are putting the founders of the Bloods. You know, they had been low riding. So uh, I don't know who who came up with the idea. You know, okay. uh, 
but they were heavy in the low riding. When, when I got started, it was, I don't know, sometimes it would be 50, 60, 100 cars uh, up at Churchy's. Okay, so you had this chop shop, and then it got raided by LAPD. Yeah. And uh, you were charged with seven counts of grand theft. Yep. And you were facing 21 years. Yep. But you beat it. Yep. And how'd you beat it? Well, what happened is um, when they raided the shop, they were looking for a guy who had snatched a purse. They wasn't looking for um, a chop shop. So when, when I saw the helicopter and I hear the, the cops walking all around the building, I'm saying, oh, they're coming in. So I took off running. I run out the building trying to get away, and eventually they run me down and caught me. They took me to the lady who, uh, who uh, purse they said had got snatched, and the lady said, no, that's not him. So technically they should have let me go right then, instantly. Right, because they didn't have a warrant. Right, you're not the one. So what they did is they kept me in the car, and they started sorting out, why was he running like that? What is he running from? So they asked me, why was you running? I was I was just running. Where were you coming from? Oh, that's my shop. Oh, that's your shop. Hmm. You're 18 years old, you got a body shop. And I said, yeah. And are these the keys? And I said, yeah, those are my keys. So uh, what they did is they went and searched. They took my keys and went and searched, and they never asked me could they do it. Hmm. So when we went to court, the judge threw it out on the illegal search and seizure. Uh, but later on, I had to pay for some of those people's cars in civil court. I got sued civilly. And... Uh, I wind up paying for people's cars who, who I'd cut up and cut tops off of. And okay. Well, here you are 18 years old, and they're telling you that you, you're facing 21 years, longer than you had been living at that point. Scared to death. So you were scared to death. Scared to death, literally. Had never been to jail. Um, was scared, terrified. Yeah. Um, no money broke. Um, so the chop shop wasn't, you didn't stack up enough to, for the lawyer fees and stuff? I put my money in the low riders. Mm. You know, I had a 57, I had a convertible six. Yeah, you were fresh. Uh, 50, uh, 63, you know, we, we took all our money and put in car. We thought that, that at that time, we thought uh, low riding was the greatest thing in the world. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't want nothing else but to low ride. Um, I spent all my days and all my nights trying to low ride. Okay. So you beat the case. Yep. Some people would say, okay, I just beat 21 years. I'm not going to do anything illegal ever again. But you didn't have that same mentality. Oh, no, no, no. I looked at it totally different. I started selling drugs while I was fighting the case. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I had to. I wouldn't have won the case without... because oh, you had to raise the money. I had to raise money for lawyers, um, just to get to court every day, you know? <laughs> it was, wasn't easy getting to court. So, so I had to start doing something. Um, you know, in the book I talk about how I was sitting on my mom's porch, and Mike, who had the chop shop with me, he was, he was going to court with me as well. All my other guys, they threw all their cases out because the business wasn't in their name. They got caught inside the shop. Uh, but they threw all their cases out immediately because their name wasn't on any paperwork. M my name, I was so dumb then, and I put my name on the, on the building as, as a leaser. And Mike had put his name on, so they arrested both of us. So when he called me, he went back to school and started playing football. So when he called me and uh, told me that he had this for me, uh, I was excited because I needed something else. Uh, and, and no, I wasn't afraid not to get back involved. I knew I had to. At the time when you started, was crack already around? Uh, they were they were smoking crack, but everybody cooked their own crack. Okay. It, it, it was, uh, and they would still eat the basin too. They were still eat the basin. You okay. know, they have all the stuff on the table, the, the ether, and, and you know, it was a big heavy, process that they were doing at that time. You know, I mean, th this part is kind of hazy, but who actually created the recipe for crack? No, I don't know. No, I idea. didn't. I know people, people come to me all the time and say, oh, you invented crack? No, I didn't invent people crack. People say it came from the Bay. They say it came from the Bay. I heard that as well. UCLA? UCLA? That's what they say? 
Uh, I don't know. I know who taught me how to cook it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I saw a lot of other people cook it before he actually taught me. But uh, 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 Stefan, one of my one of my little homies, Stefan, rest in peace. He's the one who taught me how to cook it. Okay. But they were already doing it when I started. When I learned how to cook it. Okay. You know, and then when you hit the ground running, you you became essentially one of the biggest drug dealers in America. I don't know. <laughs> Who keeps stats? You know uh, exactly. But but you were you know the prosecutor. You, you, you got to a massive scale. Yeah, the prosecutors say I, I was a major player in in, okay. in the game, and and it was during the, the early times too, when when the weight wasn't as high. You know, mm -hmm. um, at that time, uh, uh, um, you know, a hundred keys was a lot of cocaine. You know, uh, when I started in the seventies. Three grams uh, was a lot of cocaine to me, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, you know, I was in jail with people who had 20 tons of cocaine, you know. So um, it's just a matter of, of who you're talking to. And, and maybe he had 20 uh, uh, kilos at one time. And maybe over my career, I sold, you know, 20 tons of cocaine. I don't, I don't know. You know, I didn't really keep stats and... and, and um, um, I, I basically just did it like I did tennis. I was trying to be the best that I could be. Well, you said um, that your only goal in life was to get as rich as you could, as fast as you could, so you can get out the game. Yeah, I got that from Superfly. Hmm. And when I watched, okay, I, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I watched the movie Superfly, and uh, uh, when he when he got out the game. Uh, you know, I said that I would like to go out just like he did, you know, and okay. and that was always my plan uh, uh, was to uh, build myself up into a position to where uh, I could walk away. Was there ever a point where you actually said, I have enough money, I'm going to go to this one country that doesn't have a U.S. extradition policy? <laughs> And just sit on an island, and and drink margaritas, and and leave all this crazy shit behind me. But it's hard to tell a young, a young black man that, who's been nowhere. Nobody's really taught him much. Okay. He but, thinks. But you're you're pretty smart. He thinks that a car that goes up and down is the greatest invention that it was ever invented. Right, but, but you didn't think that when you were at the height of your drug career. I mean, you were sitting... Oh, no, I totally switched. I mean, I learned a lesson from that little rider. See, I, I sat back and I, I looked and I said, man, you know, with that chop shop, you made five dollars $600 every day, which was great money at that time, mm -hmm. and you have nothing to show for it. Mm. So what I did, I took my low rider to the junkyard, and they got this big crusher that crushes them. I wish I would have saved the car now. Because it was a convertible. <laughs> car probably worth about 50000 right now, right? So, but symbolically, that's what you wanted to do. I wanted to crush that mentality. Hmm. By crushing your actual lowrider. Yeah. You know, the paint up under the bottom. I had, I had candy paint under the bottom, all hmm. the chrome. Okay. The rear end was chromed. You know, and I'm like, hmm. you've been doing every night. You go off stealing every night. You work all day stealing to put this car together, and, and, and that's all you got. So when I went into the drug business, I said, no, I ain't going to sell dope for no car. Right. I mean, at one point, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but, you know, because when you're doing that, you have a lot of money on the street. You have people that owe you. You have products. You have product coming in. You have this. You have that. What was the most amount of cash that you actually had where you could say, okay, I could take this bag and just leave? Well, really, really... Um when I started, I only wanted to make $5,000. Okay. I wanted to get the wheels for my car. <laughs> <laughs> that was our plan. We would get some, some Zeniths for our car, which cost like $3,200. Yeah, the Zenith uh, wire wheels. Yep. I was going to finish paying Mike for painting it and uh, get my interior out. And, um, and it's crazy that all of these things that I'm telling you that I was going to do, all of those had connections to the drug business, right? All of those were things that eventually played a part inside of the, the drug business. Uh, so, so technically, 
you know, I could have walked away at 5,000. But what happens is once you become exposed and once your mind is start, started to open and, and uh, started to see things, you know, my mom, my mom put me out, right? My mom put me out the house when she found out that I was selling drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I come home and she's counting my money. I had like 100 grand. I never counted it. You know, I just been like re up and throw it in the, the shoebox with it, overcome the shoebox. So now I've become a pile of dirty clothes, had become my safe. <laughs> so uh, we just piling everything in. Uh, and me and Al were, were partners at that time. Uh, you never met Al, but, uh, and most people don't even, they don't remember him, but uh, he, he, me and him were like this, you know, he was my, my, my partner when we stole cars, um, and we became partners in, in, in the cocaine business. But um, one time I had two point, I mean 3.2 million, I had the motel, I had tire shop, body shop, junkyard, apartment buildings, houses. 3.2 million, this is the 80s? Yeah. So this is the equivalent of maybe six, seven million today? Probably like 84-ish. Yeah, six, seven, eight million dollars today. An amount that you could retire off of. Yep. And still live a pretty nice lifestyle. You know, literally live the rest out, you know, the rest well, the of the Well, the way days. I lived, though, I probably would, would have been living like a king. Because I had tow trucks. I mean, I had race cars, uh, yeah. fast bikes. Uh, um, so, so, but there was never any serious thought about saying, I'm going to take all this money and go retire somewhere. At that time, I'd never been scared by the police. Well, what I want to say is, for example, um, there was an interview that we have on our, on our YouTube channel. Uh, I didn't do the interview personally. My friend Cavario did it, but he interviewed Big Meech from BMF. Meech had somewhat of a similar story. And he asked him flat out, why, you know, why didn't you just take the money and just go somewhere where there's no U.S. extradition? If I was for self, I could have did that. I could have grabbed me a bunch of millions and been on somewhere where you can't be extradited. But that wasn't what I was out for. I was out, I, I've already played the illegal game to the fullest. So now I was trying to legitimize me and the whole family. I mean, I was 37 years old when I got picked up. So I'm, I was slowing down anyway as far as I was getting kind of tired. But when you the face of the family, that's the one thing that I was starting to learn. Even at 37 years old, even though I'm feeling old because I've been doing it so long, like I'm, I was getting kind of tired. You know, you know me, I'm popping pills, smoking weed, drinking and partying, freaking, getting money, got whips going up and down the road. You know, I'm doing everything to try to make this family successful and everything we do look big. Everything. Everything we do got to look big. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I understand that too, yeah. What, what, what your family do, and not just your immediate family, your because... Family. Crew, but your crew, everybody, they, they do keep you, they do keep you into the game because they start to depend on you. Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> but but I, I, I still could have did it. I still could have did it. My problem was is that I had never been scared by the police. You know, the police had never raided my house. Um, but, but you were facing 21 years before, so. But that was for, for GTA. Still. Now, drugs, I felt, and, 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 and at this time was before the feds had came in. So it was one time that you was being taught that the only way you could be arrested for drugs was if they caught the drugs on you. You know, this was before we knew about the conspiracy charges. The, the, the RICO Act. And the RICO Act and, yep. and, 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 and all that stuff. But it all, all, that, all that boils around conspiracy. Right. Because, for example, you know, we were just talking about Big Meech. They didn't catch him with anything. Right. You know, it was all RICO. It was all people. Conspiracy. No, conspiracy all, was, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the glue. Yeah. The RICO is just a statue. Right. But, yeah, it was all conspiracy. It was yeah, all other people is, saying he did it and he, and then right, he that's the conspiracy. Ultimately had a, he ultimately pleaded out to. Correct. Yeah. That's the conspiracy, though. Yeah. The conspiracy is that, for instance, like, say, for instance, when I go to court, the judge is going to tell the jury or the prosecutor is going to tell the jury, well, we're never going to catch him with drugs. It's not going to happen. 
we're not going to catch him with money because he always tells other people to carry the drugs and to carry the money. Yep. So in order to tie you to the drugs, they have to tie you to the conspiracy, right. saying that you and this person had a meeting of the minds. And, and you can have a meeting of the minds and do very little and get the conspiracy. Yeah, I mean, for example, I interviewed uh, Biggs from Rockefeller. He was the co-founder, along mm -hmm. with Jay-Z and Dame Dash. Okay. And uh, he went to jail for some sort of marijuana growing charge, which to me was mind blowing because it's like, yeah, this guy's a multimillionaire. He's the co-founder of Rockefeller and Rockaware and Armadale Vodka and everything. So I interviewed him and I asked him, I said, what, what was that about? And he, and he told me flat out, he said. So what happened was I, it was a conspiracy because I connected somebody from New York to a farmer in uh, California. I was actually buying dispensaries and I was gonna buy I was looking to purchase some of these farmers' houses as well to sell to the dispensaries, thinking I'm building a vertical business. But in that time, it takes three, six, or nine months to get up and running. So a friend of mine asked me to connect them with somebody. And because they connected, even though they didn't do a deal, they spoke about it on the phone. That's a conspiracy. And I conspired because I connected them. Aiding and abetting. Yeah. And That's he, all he, it he is. He did a few years if over there. If, if you give me your car, knowing that I'm going to do a drug deal, you, you got the conspiracy. Wow. They can tie you to whatever crime I commit. If I go out and kill somebody, you can get the murder. Yeah. If you knew that that's what I was going to use your car for. Right. Because that's the meeting of the mind. Right. And if there's four people that said that Vlad knew why he was giving Ricky the car, then now... Right. It's or if the jury just believed me. Hmm. You yeah. know, they don't need four people. If the jury just believed me over you, or if you don't testify and they just believe my testimony, yeah. then, then they can find you guilty. It's ugly. Yeah, oh, the feds is, is wicked. <laughs> <laughs> so when you start dealing with uh, Blandon, uh, how, how do you pronounce the name? Uh, Blandon. D D Danilo? Danilo Blandon. Danilo Blandon, a name that I'm sure you'll never forget. No. <laughs> um, Another one of those situations. <laughs> uh, how did you get linked up with him initially? Uh, I was dealing with, with, with a guy named Henry and Ivan uh, uh, when I started and Ivan got shot and paralyzed and, and Henry was, was always like a drunk, you know, stayed drunk. Uh, but I met Henry first uh, and Henry was scary too, you know, he was, he was scared, you know, uh, probably hadn't had much contact with blacks. Um, and he turned me over to Ivan, and then eventually when Ivan got uh, shot and paralyzed, then Henry turned me over to uh, Danilo. Who was the plug, Who essentially. The plug? <laughs> uh, and you had no idea that he was financing the war in Nicaragua. Uh, I did know that they were financing, that they were fighting a war in their country. I didn't know that it was the Contras or it was Nicaragua, no. Okay, but ultimately that's what was happening. He was taking yeah. the drug money that you guys were making and financing a war in South America. Yep. When you found that out, how, how mind blowing was that? Well, I didn't find that out till I was in prison. You know, oh, looking okay. At, looking at a life sentence. Okay. Uh, I didn't know until Gary Webb uh, had put the story together and, and published the article, uh, Dark Alliance. Uh, I was baffled, you know, that. Uh, that this guy was tied to the United States government. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Even when, 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 when Gary published the story, uh, I still found it hard to believe. And then especially me too, you know, like, come on, Rick, how, you, how Ricky Ross get in this <laughs> circle, you know, like. So, so he was working directly for the government? Uh, he was an operative. You, you know, uh, if, you, if you're a foreign uh, nationalist and, and, and you don't have your citizenship, then you can't work directly for the government. You know, you have to, uh, you have to be what they call as an operative, meaning that they can hire you, uh, uh, but you don't work for the government. Okay, but he was being paid. He's been paid by, by the, the government. government. Yes. How much did the government pay him? Millions? I don't remember. I, I mean, uh, we talked about, you know, monies that, um, 
Enrique Ramirez received from from uh, uh, George Bush and Ronald Reagan, but we didn't uh, find out exactly what uh, amount of money he was paid specifically. Um, and you know, he was saying that he was a patriot to his country, so he probably would have did this for free. Yeah, pretty pretty deep. Yeah. And yeah. when the whole thing blew over, what was the name of the the guy that had to testify? Um, who, who didn't recall anything. Oh, uh, um, uh, I can't think of his name. Um, Oliver North. Was it Ali North? Yeah, Ali North. Oliver North. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, Oliver North was, uh, he was the guy that, he was really the fall guy. You know, he, he, he um, kind of like what's going on with, with, with Trump right now, with Cohen and, uh, and, um, and, and Trump's lawyers and, and you know, and Flynn and, and all those guys. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, at that time, you know, I guess Reagan, we didn't have the internet too, you know, so a lot of things were different then. Uh, uh, and they were able to, to keep it quiet and, and uh, Oliver North knew that he was getting a, pres a, a presidential pardon from George Bush. So, you know, they pardoned Oliver North. And it's the first time too that that type of situation ever happened and no investigation ever took place because he pardoned him before it could even be an investigation. It would almost been like if Trump would have been smart, he would have pardoned Michael Flynn and Cohen, all those guys. Oh, I'll pardon all of you guys. You pardons. You know, uh, uh, Mullen stopped them. You don't even need to do an investigation because they all got pardons. And this was Bush Sr. Yeah, it was Bush Sr. So Bush Sr. pardoned Oliver North. Yeah. Because Bush was really in on it. I mean. Allegedly. Uh, you you could say that I don't know I don't know the facts. Why else would he pardon? <laughs> I mean seriously. I mean you know everybody got to got to use their own common sense you know uh, about what what took place uh, uh, with that you know the CIA said that uh, we knew they were selling drugs but we didn't sanction it. Hmm. You know when when it's your job to stop it, um, and then you also go to the Attorney General and give a letter and say, hey, we know that if we know if somebody's selling drugs and we don't stop them, uh, it's against the law. Hmm. But let's do this here. Let's change the law for a little while. Right, because essentially, from, from what I understand, you can correct me if I'm wrong, was that the U.S. wanted to fund this, this war in Nicaragua. They didn't have the actual funding from the government, so they used the drug money to finance what the government wasn't giving them. Correct. Correct. They, they said uh, that they gave them $18 million to fight a war that Russia had gave the Sandinistas $100 million. Right. And this was in the 80s where essentially the U.S. and Russia were at war, but since they couldn't fight each, each other. other directly, they would have these little wars in countries like Vietnam and Nicaragua, Afghanistan. Right wherever else, and we would just fund whatever side. Right. Because at one, at one point, we were funding bin Laden in Afghanistan. <laughs> he was one of our guys. Yeah. Against Russia. And then, <laughs> you know, look what happened ultimately. Yeah, switched up. And, and right. That, that's kind of what happened over in Nicaragua. Well, yeah. Um, but we picked the wrong side. We picked the losing side. So, okay, so the side that America funded ultimately lost, even Correct. with all the drug money and everything else like that. Correct. And that's why those guys fleed from there and came over here. Wow. And in order to get their country back, they really started selling drugs full steam ahead. Right. Well, you know, as, as Danilo said, Enrique Ramuda said, when he went on the fishing trip with George Bush and came back, that the ends justify the means. Yeah. And Oliver North uh, this year was actually made the president of the NRA. I heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> After having a show on Fox for like 15 years. Uh, yeah, man, it's kind of funny how certain people end up in prison and certain people end up with TV shows. Like, well, it's about, pardons. It's about your, 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 your ties and your plugs, you know, who you know, who you don't know, uh, how much money you got. Um, you know, all those things play a big role in, 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 in this, you know, in this system. You know, if, yeah. if Trump was anybody but Trump, for, for all perspectives, he would be in prison right now. And he still might be. You never know. You don't think so? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, it, and what's interesting is, you know, you mentioned Gary Webb. He was the one that wrote the article. 
exposing yeah. all this, he somehow committed suicide by shooting himself in the head twice. Um, which amazing. Which is, amazing. Is, you know, I don't think it's ever been done before. But <laughs> I guess the medical examiner, that was their conclusion, found, that he committed suicide. The examiner by said it was possible. He shot himself in the head twice. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. You think he was assassinated? Uh, I mean, I would refer to that, you know. Um, I haven't saw the police report or, the, or the, the coroner's report or anything like that, but, you know, just from my logical sense that, you know, that I've been living, uh, if a person shot himself in the head, would he have the wherewith to pick the gun up and say, you know what, you didn't kill yourself, do it again. I mean, that's, that's yeah. pretty amazing for a person. I mean, his determination was, <laughs> was off the chain. <laughs> if you were to make a wild guess as to who killed him, who would you say? Somebody who didn't like him, hmm. or didn't like what he said. So it could have been a number of people, you know. I mean, yeah. he implemented uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, he implemented Bush, he implemented Oliver North, he implemented the CIA. Uh, I mean, you know, he put a lot of names in, in, in his articles, so, um, and those guys were still living. You know, Ronald Reagan was living when he did that article. He wasn't, yeah, he and, wasn't deceased. Right, and as far-fetched as you may think it is, I mean, right now in 2018, you saw that one um, uh, journalist killed. Uh, yeah, and uh, he, he was in Turkey at the time, and, but... All the reports, including the CIA, said that the king of Saudi Arabia, or the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, was the one that planned, you know, that Absolutely. put that hit out. Absolutely. Yeah. But so. he said he didn't. Right. Which he should. I mean, who's going to admit? <laughs> yeah, who's going to admit to that? <laughs> I mean, he go downtown and, right. and they, they'll line up. Well, who's innocent? And everybody in there going to yeah. put their hands up. And this is why it's important, you know, you know, th th this, this drives me to do the type of interviews that I do. Is yeah. that like, you know, you, and, you know, and you do take a day, you know, you take a risk. Oh, no question. When no you question. interview certain types of people and talk about certain certain issues, like, you know, people don't like me, you know, over interviews that I've done, but it just is what it well, is. Well, I can't tell on the streets. Yeah. They all talk about you. <laughs> they the want to know you. They want right. to know you. <laughs> what do he look like? How is he? <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, you know, when, when I first started doing your shows, I thought it was just like another, um, you know, uh, podcast. That, yeah. That, that A couple hundred people watch it and that's it. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you millions know, of views later, <laughs> I go out on the streets and people be like, "Man, you Rick Ross? I saw you on." I was like, "What?" <laughs> I was yeah. like, "Oh, this dude got to reach." I'm in Miami. They talking about you in Texas, and you know, because we we did a, a book tour last year. You know, we stayed on the road for about eight months, mm -hmm. and uh, every city we went to, man, they was like, "We saw you on there. We saw you. We saw you." I thought it was gonna be the BET American Gangster. Or, but it was, no, nah, man, I'm, you kick up dust, man. We got the streets. Uh, that's, one thing, <laughs> that's one thing that we got. You were able to avoid the police for a long time because you had better equipment than they did? Nah. No, nah, you wouldn't say that? I was just smarter than you. Really? Yeah. Explain. Well, well, you know, the police had an image of what they thought a drug dealer should look like or how a drug dealer thought. And, and my thinking was totally the opposite. You know, when, when, when I was in the game, I was in the game not just for myself, but for my whole, my whole block. And, and, and uh, you know, I practice a, a, a thing of not overshining my friends. You know, I don't want to, um, I didn't want to just take my money and, and, and I look richer than, than, than my friends did. You know, that mm -hmm. wasn't what I was doing it for. You know, I wasn't doing it so that I could snap my nose at the people who didn't have. I was doing it to get myself in a position to where I could live comfortably for the rest of my life and never have to do nothing if I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my goal. Uh, so the police wasn't used to anybody doing that. They was used to the guys who wore all of their wealth on their neck, uh, on their car. On their car, with their clothes. But I tell you what I did to my car, and not only did that do the car, but that also did the whole look, the whole persona. Right, because people actually thought that you were one of the smokers. They did. Yeah. I mean, some guy Which did a post a couple br weeks ago. Brilliant. Right? This guy, Bosco, did a post a couple weeks ago, you know, and uh, uh, I was by my tire shop, my, my car shop, where I fixed my cars at, and 
And you know, I had on a hoodie, just like I always do, and I'm standing mm -hmm. in the middle of the alley, probably, probably giving orders, directing traffic. Oh, put it over there, there doing it. You know, I'm always doing that. And uh, somebody took a picture passing by, I think, and uh, and this guy Bosco posted it up and uh, said, "Look at him. Look like he's looking for a ten dollar hit with only seven dollars." <laughs> <laughs> Bosco's been by the show before. I oh, yeah. Been before. yeah cool I need dude. to meet him. Can you hook us up? Yeah, of course. I want to holler at Bosco. Done deal. <laughs> I thought it was so funny when somebody yeah. told me. I just fell out laughing. I was like, oh, like that thing. I like that. But uh, anyway, everybody else got on him about it. It was like, man, this dude looked like that when he uh, uh, had millions. Yeah. And that allowed me to avoid the police because the police wasn't used to... Uh, having to figure it out who, mm. who the drug dealer was. You know, it's really easy to see who the drug, drug dealers are in South Central. You know, he's driving a Mercedes Benz or a Porsche or a Lamborghini. And me, I would just go borrow one of my friends when I wanted to go out. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I remember I, I interviewed uh, Cookie Money. Uh, Cookie Money, Cookie he, Money. He's from the Bay. He's a rapper, but, you know, he has a, you know, a street background. Yeah. And you know, we, we were talking about cars, and, and I mentioned to him that uh, I had a Maserati at one point, and he goes, I, I hate Maseratis. Actually, Maserati was the car I went to jail in. It's my least favorite car. <laughs> That's your least favorite car? The least favorite car. No, uh, the, actually, the police say it's the most famous drug dealer car. Really? The Maserati, yeah. Yeah. That that is that is right. You see you see a young black guy in a, in a Maserati. Pull him over. They, they will automatically assume that that's a drug dealer. Oh no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. You know he said that's why he hates those cars. Well, you know? I hate any any when when I sold drugs, I hated anything that shined. Yeah. Because I didn't want attention. You know, uh, I I had a Ford that I fixed up. I made it look like a hearse, <laughs> just so people wouldn't look at it. You know, I found out that. Uh, yeah, when do you pull over a Hearst? Like, you know, I mean, Never. Like, what are you going to find in No, there? when do you look at it? <laughs> you don't even want to look at it. You're not even going to look know, at it, yeah. I, I mean, uh, 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 like I said, I'm, really? always, I'm always thinking and, and looking. So one day I was sitting at a stoplight and there was a Hearst right next to me and I keep finding myself like glancing, but I really don't want to look at it. And then I was like, wow, that's the perfect disguise. That's the perfect nobody disguise, wanna look at those. a Hearst. Everyone's watching, man. Get, get rid of those... Uh those phantoms <laughs> <laughs> and Benzes get you get you a hearse. Well, you know, even even when the, when the crooked cops were going to court, uh, one of the things that that they testified to was uh, it took them a while to even believe that it was that kind of money in South Central. You know, it was only after they started seeing the guys with the Benzes and and and, and those cars that really tipped them off to know that uh, we were having that kind of money. Well, you had the police shoot at you before. A few times. A few times. <laughs> uh, how many times total? I think two. Okay. And you were actually unarmed. Every time. Every time. Yeah. The only time I really carried a gun is if I went to like the skating ring or party. Okay. You know, somewhere I was going to be by myself uh, um, and vulnerable, basically. When I sold drugs, I didn't have no gun. Well, the guys with you had guns, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It is what it is. <laughs> You're not gonna tell me you guys just ran around unarmed everywhere. No, right? no, 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 no. I'm we, not gonna we, believe We were that. heavy. We were heavy armed. You know, but yeah. what what I'm saying is the the guys that we sold drugs to, we didn't worry about them. Yeah, worried about the the, the other guys, guys who didn't know about yeah. us, who wasn't part of our business. You know, would be the guys that you would have to worry about. Well, I interviewed Big U. Uh, Big U, my man. You know, who's a affiliated with the Rolling Sixties. And um, he was in jail, like for a stretch, like before crack showed up. Mm -hmm. And then he came out when crack was already on the street. I mean, when he got out of prison. Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys were close. We were cool, and we wasn't. We wasn't close. You know, I'm I'm from South Central LA. Yeah. My neighborhood is Hoover Hood, and he from '60. They like arch enemies, but oh. uh, um, you know, I was able to. I was able to cross the line. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew Petey Wack, uh, which is Hugh's big homie, um, Cat. So, you know, I, I, knew, I knew most of them, but. The one thing he said he noticed when he got out and, and crack was all over the street was that the level of artillery was now different. So when it, when it actually hit was like 83, 
And I came back home in 84. And we went from being able to just, and it, it, it changed it because two things happened major. The, uh, um, the influx of guns and the different kind of guns and then like the automatics and the automatics like yeah because we hadn't even seen automatics we weren't even having no automatics then and especially like what the the uh, most the, we was we was inflamed by the nine millimeter from the movie that came from new york was um king of new york mm. when um lawrence finsburn had the nine millimeters and the king of new york we was like oh that <laughs> what the you know what i mean because we come from the clint eastwood era the, the pistols and the 4.5 and the magnums. So when crack came, all the different movies came that influenced the culture at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it did, it changed. Was that just because the drug dealers had more money to buy these things or was the level of violence just so much more escalated? Uh, money to buy, more yeah. so. I mean, um, because we had guns that, that we never used, but um, we were under the impression that we may have to use them. You know, uh, we had Mac 10s, fully automatic, Thompsons, AKs. I mean, we had the money. You know, our, our arsenal probably was in hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars just in guns. There were stories. Um, a couple of people have have said these stories. I know uh, Trey D said it, and also um, uh, BG Knock and Andre said, said that they've always heard stories where crates of guns would be found in the hood. They bring a train out there just full of guns, you know, and, and, just have and people it. just hit the train and, you know, next thing you know, you'll hear some hood somewhere, you know, selling, you know, new nines for 300, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Or they got AKs over here for 700 and, you know, just like, yeah, it was always mysterious crates of weapons popping up throughout the ghetto. I heard from an OG that they used to find barrels of guns along the train tracks yeah. just sitting there, Uzis, like fully automatic guns, bro, like just sitting there for people to find, little kids in the ghetto throwing rocks on the train tracks, what they do, stumble across a whole barrel of guns. So you think the government Absolutely. left them there? I've heard those stories too, I never saw that. You never saw that? No. Okay, but you have heard those stories? I heard those stories, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, I mean, we bought guns from Danilo, um, he was the first person to ever show us fully automatic weapons. Because mm. um, he had the whole... <laughs> right, right. But I never saw, you know, crates of guns. I've heard of the train stopping in, in the hood with, tr with guns on them. I know, I think uh, uh, Maxine Waters talked about it before. Mm -hmm. uh, train stopping and, and, and being unhooked full of guns. So I've heard their stories, but I haven't okay. saw with my own eyes. We had uh, Lil D on our show recently. That's my uh, man. Daryl Reed. Yeah. And uh, he actually talked about how he met you the first time. So I met this guy at Freeway Rick, right? When I met him, he was in his old, old station wagon, you know? And he was dressed like a bum. But they told me that this was his mm -hmm. M.O., you know? He would look like a bum, but he'd get money, right? So I met him. He said, man, how old is you? And I, I told him, and he said, and, um... Who you, who you down here? Who sent you down here to do business? I say, man, this is, I'm, I'm doing the business, you know? Yeah, man, uh, I remember they was telling me about Little D. And it was like, this little dude, man, I think he must have been about 18 years old, I guess. Yeah, really young. He was young. I was young, too. I was probably only about 24, 23, something. I was still young myself, but, right. you know. He was really young, though. Yeah, he was real young. Like he, he was, was running it at, like, 16 and yeah. then kind of built up. At 18. Yeah, he was yeah, like he so, was essentially the crack king of Oakland. Yeah, yeah, he was. And at that time he was spending six hundred thousand, I think, maybe. At like eighteen years old. So uh yeah, D was killing it. And uh, I, I remember <laughs> I remember when we first met, when I got in the car and okay. I think we were riding in a van, somebody picked us up in a van and, and he was in the car and they was like, Man, this is such and such and such and such. He's from Oakland and uh, I'd heard of his uncle. Already, you know, it wasn't actually his uncle. Okay, Felix Mitchell. We talked about that in the interview. Everyone thought, everyone kind of assumed and ran with that story. Yeah, but technically, it wasn't. It wasn't his uncle. It was someone that took him under his wing. Okay, okay. But it wasn't actually Felix Mitchell. Wasn't actually his uncle. So the streets just took it upon themselves and started saying that Felix Mitchell was my uncle. Okay. So in actuality, he's not my uncle, and I've always tried to explain that. You know. 
All right. Well, I was always under the impression yeah, that every, everyone was. <laughs> yeah, that was his uncle, and, yeah. and, and um, I had never heard of D. So when we met that day, it was like, uh, all right, cool. <laughs> Did you? Do you remember any of the conversations you guys had? Was there anything that you kind of tried to impart on them? Nah, not really. Not really. Uh uh-uh. uh. I can't remember. We we got we got tighter in jail. Ah, okay. When we were in jail together, we got tighter than uh than we were on the street. You know, uh, on the street it was more of customer uh, uh, buyer seller relationship. Were you actually supplying to him? I have, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and he ended up getting caught on his 20th birthday and uh, got a 35-year sentence. Yeah. Which he ended up doing 27 and a half years, ultimately getting clemency from Obama. Yeah, that was devastating. But, um, yeah, he did a lot of, he, and he did just about all his time. Obama really didn't do much yeah, Shaved off a few years. Yeah, yeah, shaved off a few years, but D had walked it down. Were you already in prison when he got arrested? No, I went after him. You went after him? Mm-hmm. Okay, so here you are. He was 20, you were like 26, 27? So, roughly. So here's a guy younger than you doing the same thing you're doing, more or less, and he just got this heinous amount of time. Yeah, but you don't know that. You don't? How would you know? Reading the news? I don't read the news. I couldn't read at that time. Oh, you couldn't read? Oh, Not at right, that time. <laughs> right, right, right. And I didn't watch the news either. Okay, so you had no idea what was happening. No, I didn't know. I mean, okay. when I found out... Uh, I don't even know if I knew D had went to jail. You know, I knew Harrio was in jail, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but, you know, Harrio was in there for the kidnapping, attempted murder. Uh, and then I know when Bo had got arrested, you know, that was all over the, over the news and everybody was talking about it. Uh, Bo? Bo Bennett. Okay. But I didn't really know, and I only knew about Bo because people called and told me. You know, oh, you know they just got Bo and they got, Corvette Mike and this and that. So, so I really didn't know, you know. Uh, I didn't keep up with the news. I didn't know that there was a crack law. I didn't know none of that stuff. If you had known how to read back then, being as intelligent as you are, and do you think that you could have avoided actually going to prison? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. If, 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 I, I, I believe that uh, selling drugs is, something that you do because you like the knowledge to be able to do something else. Um, and a lot of times we are afraid to try other things because we don't think that we can do it. Hmm. You know, um, and that's how I was at that time. I, I didn't feel that uh, there was no other options for me. So mine was do or die, you know, uh, I'm gonna make it or I'm gonna die doing it. Yeah, get rich or die try. Yeah, like they say. Like, they, like, like, like 50 they say. said, yeah. 50 cent. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, and I, I remember when I talked to Little D when I said what, what separated you from the Felix Mitchells and the Freeway Rickies and, and stuff like that. And he said, uh, what, I'm gonna say this what separates me from the guys like Freeway Rick and a lot of these other guys who had a run and who made a lot of money. All these guys was much older than me, right? None of them guys did what I did at my age. Um, and even though they might have been in the game hustling for many years, I achieved what I did within a three or three and a half year period of time and, and a teenager in high school going to school. So my story I can easily separate my story from these guys that we're talking about, though these guys, all these guys are much older than me, right? Yeah. And ultimately, when, when Lil D got arrested, well, number one, he told me that. When I got arrested that night, I accepted it right then. I said, it's, it's over. Mm-hmm. Like, like immediately out the gate, wasn't no in denial. Man, I'm going to beat this case. It was those conversations with my older partners who told me, man, you jump off the porch, you get caught up for whatever you choose to do, you gotta accept the consequences, because if you tell 
we gonna kill you. See, that's what I, that's the cloth I come from up under. I come up under a different cloth. And he didn't tell on anybody. He had ledgers with like 50 names in it. And they were like, well, just tell us all these names are and so forth. He said, no. Yeah, Lil D was silent. Were you in a similar situation? No, I didn't keep ledgers. Were you in a similar situation where they asked you to, to give up a bunch of people? Well, I was fortunate that uh, my first time that I went, that I had the cops on my case. And in, in my situation, they caught me, I wasn't selling drugs. You know, I've never been caught red-handed selling drugs. Okay. What did they catch you with? Nothing. Conspiracy? Conspiracy. Okay. So I always felt that I had an, an opportunity to win. And I had started this investigation on the cops before I ever got arrested. Hmm. You know, I'd hired an investigator. Um, and that wound up being my, my ace in the hole. Hmm. So in my situation, the guys that, um, that they would have wanted had already been arrested hmm. and was telling on me. Ah, right, yeah, I think you mentioned that last time. Yeah, so, so my situation was, was, was kind of different. Um, the second time, they did uh, um, ask for cooperation. And you wouldn't give it to them? I didn't know nobody. <laughs> okay. And like, you got Danilo Blandon, yeah. you know. And he, he went to prison? No. No. He, he was working for the government. So he, he walked away. Right. Is he still alive? Uh, I'm sure he is. Hmm. Yeah. I haven't heard that he passed. Okay. What would happen if he walked in the room right now? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I have absolutely nothing against him. Really? No. Nah. Wasn't his fault. See, the way I look at it is, first of all, I made the mistake of getting in the drug business. That was my first mistake. Mm -hmm. My next mistake was I went back into the drug business as I said I quit. Yeah. So what he did is he only did what people do in the drug business. They tell. They set you up. Hmm. And for somebody to go into the drug business and not understand that, which I was in the drug business and didn't understand it, mm -hmm. um, but I came to grips with it. Yeah, I mean, just recently in my own personal life, I started thinking about all the people I'm, I'm upset that, that, that are, I'm still angry at over various things that have happened to me over the years. And I started thinking about how there was one guy I'm still angry at over a fight we got into in high school, and this guy had committed suicide some years later, and he's dead, and I'm still angry at him. Wow. And, and, and I started thinking, like, okay, what's wrong with my head right now? Like, why am I feeling this way over someone who's dead that will, there'll never be any closure? And what I realized at that point is that what I needed to do is take a step back and look at every situation and take responsibility for my role absolutely. in all those situations. Not absolutely. to feel like I was a victim and how this person wronged me for absolutely no reason to say, well, yes, this guy did something to me, but I, I was actually at fault also. I did these things that led up to it. Absolutely. And, that's and, the way and I once I started taking responsibility for my own role, Actions. I started to feel less angry at the person and the situation, and it made me feel better as a human well, being. Well, that's really how I got out of prison. Hmm. You know, I got out of prison that same way, because uh, once I figured that, uh, that I wasn't a victim and that I should be in prison for my actions, then I realized that it was my actions that got me in, and it could be my actions that get me out. Right. So I started making the steps to, to and it's crazy that I, I just talked to the lawyer <laughs> who represented me just, just before we got here. And, um, you know, he was asking me uh, about somebody that I was mad at, and I was like, mad at him for what? I ain't mad yeah. at nobody. You know, I don't have anybody in the world that I'm mad at. You know, uh, first thing, being mad is being out of control anyway. Yeah. You know, I never want to be a mad person. True. Because once you become mad, then you're no longer in control. Yeah. You're just mad. <laughs> One of the things that the little D told me was that when he got arrested, there was a lot of money and assets and so forth that were in other people's names and being held by other people. But as the years progressed, they disappear. Yeah. They start and they, they'll justify it to you and book. say, well, you don't really need it. You just need commissary money. And I needed it for this, that, and the third. Absolutely. And over time, 
all this stuff that people were holding eventually went away. And when you get all that time, you have to trust somebody. You got to let people owe money. You got to let people have their, your, your properties and their names. And majority of the guys that you will have a conversation with that did a bunch of those years, throughout those years, family and friends, they gonna spend that money, man. Because they feel like you don't need it, though. Like they, In their mind, they say, all you need is some money to go to the commissary and get on the phone. Absolutely. Same thing with you? Same thing. Same thing. Identical stories. Identical. Yeah. So all these people that are getting locked up who think that their their the relatives media, and their homies are going to hold on to that half a million in cash and that and, property and those cars and when you, you know come what? out. And when you when you when you when you doing it, you're thinking like you're going to accumulate this stuff. And when you come home, you will have that. Yeah. But when you came out, you had nothing. Nothing. So all this stuff that people were holding was all gone. Zero. That's what my next book is about mm. when I got out. What I had, how I had to start over. Right. The so you walked called, away, you, you came in a multimillionaire and walked out. Zip. Dead broke. No motels, no apartment buildings, uh, no tennis pros, you know, all the things that I thought would, uh, would hold together. And the people who were able to keep the property, uh, uh, property became theirs. In and their it, minds, it was their property. And they weren't trying to give it back to you? No, no. Do you feel some type of way about that? No. No, you accepted it. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> That's so crazy. You know, you know what though? See, see, see. And D probably could could also answer this for you too. When you talk to him, if you talk to him again, to lose your life and get it back. And and D didn't lose his life. He had 35 years, which is a long time. But with with me, I had natural life. Mm. They told me I was never going out again, that I would never be a free man. So to now to be able to walk the streets and, you know, travel the country and, and what do I have to be mad about? Right. Have access to women. Oh <laughs> Not be around a bunch of men. Don't even mention that for it. <laughs> 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 you know, right. it'd be crazy. Like, uh, sometimes you go, you see a woman and she'd be ugly and stinking and, and I said, man, they'll kill for her in jail. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's Beyonce in prison right now. Hey, they will kill you over her. Yeah. Yeah. R real talk. L literally. D literally. Literally. I'm not talking, I'm not talking uh, uh, in, in retrospect. I'm talking about will literally take a knife and put a knife in you. Yeah. So you come out dead broke. Were you on probation no, or I parole? I had $200. $200. Okay. <laughs> dead broke. Uh, <laughs> Did, were you on probation or parole at that time, or no? I was on parole for uh, I wind up I wind up doing I think six years on paper. Uh, I had eight. Okay. So you were on parole for six years, and you managed to. Yeah, I had to walk a tight rope. You know, yeah. Because you know I always straddle the fence. Right. <laughs> but you weren't trying to go back in. No, I wasn't going. I wasn't going back in. I, um, you know they took me back to uh, uh, to send me back. You know I went to Philly and. Uh, me and uh, Jimmy the Saint took a picture together. Me and Jimmy the Saint wrote a book together called Black Scarface. Okay. So when I went to Philly, uh, he came out to the event with the book. And we took a picture together. And he took the picture and put it on Facebook. And this was, you're not allowed to affiliate not with felons. Not to affiliate with felons. And he was especially a Especially with people you know are felons. Mm -hmm. And especially people you did time with. So mm -hmm. his PO saw it, called my PO. And they said we were in the joint together. And uh, he went back. It over that picture? Back. Yeah, he went back over the picture. Well, my, my judge wouldn't put me back. Wow. She was like, that's probably all he knows. I mean, this judge, I had won this judge's, uh, um, what's the word, admiration. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when they, they, she saw me learn how to read. Yeah. She saw me doing the law, you know, so we argue in court. <laughs> I told her I was coming back. She said, she'll see me when I get back. When I got back, she said, oh, you told me you was coming back. So, uh, yep. uh, cause you know, when, when you, when, when you're going off on a pill, you know, the chance of you winning your pill is slim to none. Mm -hmm. So when I walked out the door, I told her, oh, I'll be back. And she was like, oh, I'll be here when you get here. <laughs> 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 so when I came back, she remembered that I told her that. Well, once you got out of the halfway house, uh, Floyd Mayweather picked yeah. you up in his Rolls Royce. Yeah. How did you and Floyd even know each other? 
I have a friend, uh, well, this is a long story, uh, a guy that I did time with, mm -hmm. his cousin worked with Floyd Sr. Okay. He knew that I wanted to get into boxing. So uh, he told his cousin, oh, you know, Rick want to get into boxing. So his cousin was like, all right, I'll hook him up with Floyd Sr. And, and then Floyd Sr. hooked me up with little Floyd. And so I was uh, filling another prophecy. <laughs> right, Floyd, who went on to arguably be the best boxer of all time. Right now. Right now. Yep. Um, how did that feel? Roll around the Rolls Royce with him and uh, I mean, fresh out the halfway house. But then what, again, you, what you, you've I had access. You had access I, to that before. What, I wasn't a Rolls. I wasn't impressed with the Rolls Royce. What what um, what I was hoping for was access mm. to the industry. You know, I boxing. Hope, yeah, I was hoping that Floyd would have would have opened the doors and gave me access, which he said he would. You know. Uh, yeah, Floyd's about Floyd though. Yeah, yeah. You know, he had a he had a, a disagreement with a friend of me and yours. Okay. <laughs> so uh, he was getting back at him. You know, taking a punch. You know, he had okay. a, a jab or something. You know, he could get at him. Mm -hmm. uh, but he never gave me the access that I thought that, that I would be afforded. Um, and, and I also thought, you know, and, I mean, for some crazy reason, I thought that Floyd understood my thinking. You know, I was saying, well, wow, this guy's, he's a, at that time, he was still a pretty good boxer. You know, he was one of the top guys at that time. And, um, but I thought he understood the way I think because of who he was. And um, he really didn't. You know, he, he had a, a, a cheap fantasy that he was able to, to get off, <laughs> and he really didn't um, catch the jewel. Yeah. You know, because it was a jewel there. He didn't understand. Um, I had just come off a victory, probably one of the biggest victories that anybody can win, bigger than a Super Bowl, bigger than an NBA championship, bigger than 50 fights in O. I just beat the United States government hmm. when they told me that I wouldn't do it. Right. So I was riding a high. Like, they say my man Reginald Lewis, when he made his first billion, they said he was walking in front of the limo. He didn't <laughs> want to ride in the limo. He's just going down the street. Like, I just hit a billion dollars. I'm the first black person in the, in the world to have a billion dollars. Yeah. But when I walked outside of that building, I was like, <laughs> I just did it. I ain't supposed to be out. That's why when so many people, when, when they question me about how did I get out? What are you doing here? And, and I totally get it because I'm not supposed to be here. I wasn't supposed to learn how to read. Mm -hmm. I wasn't supposed to become smarter than my lawyer, smarter than the judge. It wasn't supposed to happen. Yeah, but here you are. Here I am. Yep. I mean, when you look at when, did you read the article that Jesse Cash did with me in LA Magazine? Did you have a chance to read that? No, I don't, I don't think so. Well, if you read that article, it looks like I'm predicting the future. <laughs> I talked about boxing, t-shirts, clothing line, record labels, um, movies. You know, my documentary, number one documentary on Netflix right now. I've been on the front page of Netflix for eight yep. months. Great documentary, by the way. Eight months I've been on the front right. page of Netflix. Uh, Al Jazeera put that together, right? Well, they're, they're behind it, I mean. They're Al not put it together, but no, they're No, they put their name on it. They put their name Ooh. on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> documentary was done when we met Al Jazeera. Right. No, I put that together. Speaking of, uh, of TV, you know, I, I know this is going to annoy you when I say this. But my favorite show on television Snow is Flake. Snowfall. I, I, I know this is going to annoy you when I say this. I, I, I know this. I know this. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> Have you watched it at all? Never. 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 Well, well, I'm not really into fairy tales. Okay. First of all. Because the story, as someone who's watched it, who's watched every episode, it is clearly the, the Ricky Ross story. Based on the, I'm, I'm okay. not saying okay. exactly. You're right. And you're right. You're probably right. But it's still, all the way to the, 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 there's a whole Nicaraguan Contra with a, with a DEA agent, you know, like 
the whole based on all the conversations you and I have had together, this is so they the probably freeway watched your, Ricky your Ross. interviews too. <laughs> <laughs> they probably did. John Singleton probably because John Singleton actually met with you before the the show came out. He read my script. He read the movie script. He read the book. He bought one of my demo books. Okay. He bought. I had got ten books when my book came. Before the book actually was delivered to me in, in bulk, they gave me ten demos. Well, one guy paid me a hundred dollars for a demo book. John Singleton, I think, he gave me fifty bucks for a demo book. Okay. Because I wasn't gonna sell the demos, and and they made me sell them. <laughs> but yeah, he uh, uh, and I ran into John too recently. Uh, it was strange. You okay, because you guys met up, and you guys were talking about doing a project together. Yeah, I wanted John to direct my movie. Okay. Uh, well, really, the whole team wanted John to direct the movie. And John Singleton's phenomenal, regardless of the differences. You know what I mean? Because Snowfall almost looks like a, a higher-budget Boys in the Hood. You know, it has that same type of feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, so you guys met up. But he still missed the mark, though, I can tell you, just from... Me talking to people, he doesn't, and, and I don't really expect him to, you know, uh, um, to really get it because he didn't live it. Right. You know, so uh, I was talking to some people the other day and they was like, well, what's going to be different than, than this and Snowfall? And I was like, well, I never saw Snowfall, but I can tell you this here. Snowfall don't know when Big Hugh got out of prison. You know, Snowfall don't know... Uh, uh, um, a lot of the other things, I ain't going to say too much because yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll be trying to pick stuff <laughs> up. Or else end up they called me, about, three of Snowfall, they called me yeah. about three months ago. It was like, man, we want you to come on as a consultant. We're running out of material. You said no. Of course not. Not now. You know, I don't want to save you. Yeah. You know, if you die, you die on your own. I ain't going <laughs> to help save you, though. I ain't going to breathe. I ain't going to breathe life into you. It's too bad. It's too bad that you weren't involved in it, because, uh, uh, like I said, it's, it is very, very similar to your story, down to the... Well, we also, to, ran, to, to I also the, ran into the actor, too. Oh, the main guy? Yeah, the main the, guy. The British I was, guy. I was at Whole Foods one day, and he recognized me, and he came up, and uh, he said how much he wished that I was actually on the set with him. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if I would have been there, they would have had to change the name from Franklin to Freeway. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Two F names. Oh, yeah. Wow. They, they really... Yeah, but, yeah, man. But, you know... But I ain't mad, though. I'm not mad at the show. You know, I, I just don't support it. And, and I don't really have time. You know, I don't really watch TV anyway. Right. Um, I, I'm too busy, you know, trying to turn to write movie scripts and, and, and TV shows and, um, you know, just do my own thing. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's too bad because uh, they did do a good job on that show. And having you involved would have, I think, made it that much better. Oh, no, show. no. If, if they would have had me on there, if people in, in, in America would have known that that was my story, they would be getting the same kind of results that, that Netflix is getting with the documentary. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and it's, it's funny because me being on the street, I get to, to know what is getting traction. You know, like I know how, we, I know how well your shows are. Like I never looked at your numbers on the Internet. Yeah. Not one time have I went on the internet and looked at your numbers. Right, but you see the people that approach you. Right, when I walk through an airport and, and people come up and, and they talk about you and they ask me what you like, then that <laughs> tells me that we got traction. Yeah. So um, the same thing when the documentary hit Netflix, you know, I could tell uh, uh, what a difference it made. Yeah. Well, I guess the, the TV series is supposed to be with the executive producers of power. Which one, mine? Yeah. Uh, that deal expired. Oh, didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, not yet. They still, they still, uh, they still on deck. You know, uh, um, they, they, uh, they want Kendrick Lamar to uh, uh, say if, if if I could tie a deal up with Kendrick Lamar, then they would uh, write the check tomorrow. Uh, oh, Kendrick had a, an appearance on Power. He had a cameo. Mm, one okay. episode. But but you know, I got other people that that we're talking to about. Uh, about uh, doing the, the series. Um, I, I really think that, that Netflix, it would be something that Netflix should have uh, picked up immediately, but I don't know, these people in Hollywood, they just don't, they-, they I, I, hate, I hate dealing with people in Hollywood. Yeah, they just don't get I, it. I absolutely hate it. 
In fact, the reason why I launched Flat TV is because I just got sick of having these conversations with TV and movie people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? This is why Vlad TV is self-sufficient. And even to this day, not a year passes where there isn't some sort of serious discussion over a TV deal or whatever else, and they've never gone anywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, it's just not. Yeah, they don't get it. It's they, a hurry they, up and wait type they, of game. And, and they go with the norms. You know, yeah, who's exactly. been here, who's been doing it, that's what we exactly. want to go with. Uh, and they don't really understand the people that they're selling these shows to. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that's why their ratings be so low, you know. And, and I, I totally get it. Now, you were actually there on the day that Harry O and Suge Knight first met. Yeah. I was instrumental in, 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 in getting them to meet. Oh, you set up that meeting? Nope. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. Harry was doing uh, Lydia's album. Right, his wife. And um, I had read an article where Easy e and Dr. Dre was feuding. Mm -hmm. And um, I told Harry, yo, I said, you need Dr. Dre to do a track on Lydia. And he said, oh, you right. So that little spark put him in motion to find out how to get in touch with Dr. Dre. So I sparked the interest right. in him and wanted to get in touch with Dr. Dre, which sent him to Ron Brown, which Ron Brown put him in touch with. I, we were selling, so it was like, D was, I don't know if D was still on the floor with us then or not. Little D might have been on the floor with us at that time. We all went downtown. Little D, little D mentioned that he knew Harry O also. The most brilliant guy I ever met in the streets that was hustling was Mike O'Harris, Harry O, out of Los Angeles. That's the smartest, business-minded dude that I ever met that come from the streets. No, we all was in, in the building together. We were in downtown L.A. together okay. at the same time, you know. Um, so that spark is what gave him the initial to, to get in touch with, uh, uh, which eventually turned out to be Shook, was Dre's manager at right. that time. So in my interview with Big U, he said that... Wouldn't have had no death row. What do you mean? I love Shook to death, but he definitely wouldn't have been moving around L.A. like that. Because in L.A., at the time, you wasn't you wasn't you wasn't saying blood. You weren't wearing no red at that time. You weren't that wasn't happening. And you definitely weren't moving like that without major situations. Do you, do you know what that means at all or? Well, you know, you had a lot of influence, you know, and the sixties was powerful. Yeah. I mean, um Even when I went to the skating ring, one of the reasons I took a, a pistol because I was going up there where the sixties ran the skating ring. You know, it was their skating ring. Mm. You know, so um, I, I could see it, you know, if, if yeah. he'd have been on the music. Um, but, you know, that's the same thing with any of us. You know, um, I slipped on hip hop. You know, I should have been the king of hip hop. Yeah. Um, DJ Pooh had took me to a house. Um, and then when I went to Dr. Dre's house for the first time, uh, I spoke to Dr. Mm. Dre when I was in prison, but I had never met him personally. Uh, but when we went up to his house and met him, he told me, uh, remember that day that you came in that little apartment? <laughs> he said, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest hip hop producer of all time. Of all times. Yeah. Right there. You right know, there. King T was there. Um, Spade. And, you know, it was like hip hop was right there. And L.A. hip hop was, 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 was right in there. that room, yeah. you know. So and I had the money. I had everything, you know. Um, I knew Dick Griffey. You know, who ultimately uh, helped launch Death Row. Who he negotiated the deal with Interscope. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I had everything that, that, that a person would have needed. Uh, I knew Dick Griffey and, and Otis Smith, 83, 84, you know, so um, if I would have only had the wherewith to stay into the music business. And they begged me to stop selling cocaine, too. Did you have a relationship with Sugar, though? No. Uh, I didn't meet Suge until he was coming in with David Kenner um, in the visiting room. What it was oh, is okay. Harry O and David Kenner had figured out a way to, uh, to get Suge in because you can only, only people they were letting in was immediate family members. Uh, but some way they had rigged where he was acting as an attorney or a paralegal or something like that there to, <laughs> to, 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 to be able to uh, 
to get in. And I met him there the same day that, that Harry met him. You, you had mentioned Terry Carter. You guys were close? Me and Terry was cool. You were cool. We, we weren't running buddies. But you knew. Uh, but I knew Terry well. You know, I knew Terry from, from Church's Chicken. Uh, I knew Big Putin. I knew Big Putin well. Okay. When you looked at the, when you look at the Suge Knight situation, when he ended up killing Terry. Yeah. Accidentally, I guess. But I think so. I, it seemed like an accident. That, I don't think that he would, you know, uh, purposely kill the, the last founder of the Bloods, you know. Uh, he was like the, 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 the last one, you know. Uh, hmm. And all that history is gone, you know. E even Putin, when, when Putin was in, in a convalescent home, you know, me and Putin used to talk on the phone and, and I was trying to get Putin to, to write a book, you know, because that was a lot of history that, that, that our youngsters don't have now. You know, and Terry was really like the last person that could have wrote that book. Yeah. Um, so, but I don't think that Suge would have tried to kill Terry on purpose. Right. But ultimately, Suge took a 28-year plea deal. Yeah. Did that surprise you? Um, he must didn't feel that he had a win, you know. Well, I, I interviewed uh, Reggie Wright, who was the head of Death Row Security, mm. who, who was talking to Suge while he was locked up. And the way he explained it to me was that... I talked to him a year, a year and a half ago. Okay. Spoke to him once after the plea. And what he pretty much explained or said was he would have had to win six times to not get life in jail. Win six times? Because there were six different charges? It was three different charges. But he would have had to beat those twice because they would have kept retrying him. Mm. It was the, the alleged threat on the, the director do, the alleged theft, which Cat Williams had played out too with the, uh, the photographer lady, and then the, the, uh, the hit and run and the attempted murder cases. Right, working with the life is over. But, I mean, but for sure, at his age, 28 years, He's going to get out of like 78, I think, if you count time served or something like that. Yeah, that's life sentence. I mean, yeah. If he makes it, because he I hear he's not it. in good health either. Yeah, yeah. I actually thought he had a reasonable chance to beat it. I, I, felt, I felt that um, that he would have had a chance to beat Terry's uh, uh, um, because they said that they saw a, a, a gun brandished and... and um, that he was hit first, yep. um, but then some other people said that he turned around, you know, after he had got away, he and turned around and came went back, back in, yeah. which is kind of premeditated in a sense. Yeah, plus it was kind of established that he was out there on the usual Suge fuck shit, yeah. you know, pushing the line with people, trying to, you know, get yeah. money out of, out of Dre, Dre and, you know, for and using Q. his image and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's one of those things where if you're going somewhere to essentially commit a crime and someone yeah. dies in the process. Then you're automatically guilty of that crime. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> I totally get that. Yeah. And that's kind of how the death row story sort of ended, you know, with Suge. Yeah. It was amazing. Suge had to run. Uh, I could have hooked up with Suge. You know, when I got out in 93, um, Suge offered to help me too, hmm. you know, with the theater. You know, I was trying to open up the old theater over on Crenshaw and Adams. Okay. You know, I wanted to do a hip hop theater. And uh, Suge had offered to help me, but then me and Harry was talking every day. And Harry and Suge had fell out, I guess. And he told me, just hold up on Suge, I got you. And, uh, you know, before I could make any moves, I went back to prison. You know, when you, when you interviewed with us, might have been the first time, you talked about how different black gangs are from Mexican gangs. Mm -hmm. You say how essentially black gangs, you know, they have, they, have, they have a shock collar maybe in the neighborhood and so forth, but they don't have the same level of no structure, structure no. and so forth. Black gangs really don't, don't, they don't have the leadership stuff like, like. No? Not like, you know, I mean, I've been in a joint with them. I had never been around Mexican gangs before or white gangs before. They have leaders. They have what they call shock callers. But you're saying that the, the Crips and Bloods didn't, didn't have that? They don't really go by those rules, you know. They got a guy that may call the shots on two or three guys, you know, they're following. But when you're talking about 
he's gonna dictate to the whole hood. That, that ain't finna happen. No. Black gangs don't do it. If they did, they would be a lot more powerful than what you know than what they what they've been. Uh, um, I think one of the problems is lack of organization. This has kind of been a topic that we've ended up running with recently. Mm -hmm. When you know, I talk to people like Mr. Criminal, who's uh, you know a rapper who's affiliated with uh, the Serenios. You know, me and Trey D talked recently. You know, oh, did you? Yep. Oh, yeah, Trey D's a regular, that's a regular on the show. Yeah, that's my man. You know, and he basically said how the difference is, and and you know the um, the obligation as far as being a part of a Mexican gang, you have to do certain things that you can't even question. Such as, give me an example. I mean, just orders. You know, it's, it's just orders, whatever, whatever. So if you say go, is. go beat up that guy, you gotta go, you know, you gotta go do it. You gotta go do it, you gotta go shoot him, gotta go do this. It's not like that, you know, it's like, you know, no, we gonna go shoot him. You know what I'm saying? You ain't, you know, or if he's a little homie and it all depends on who's above him that's telling him to do it, how he respects them, that, that how he responds. You know, it's not, it's not a, a do or die situation. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? No, there's nobody that's gonna, with yeah. a gang, take a vote and, and, and they take care of you. With the Mexican gang, they already have their laws. Yeah. And you're gonna follow their laws. Yeah. Like, uh, you can't sleep in a cell with a black guy. Really? No, it's against the law. A Mexican gang member cannot have a black celly? No. He has to go to the hole. So he has to basically fight that guy? If, or, or, or something of if, that? If, if the numbers are, are level, or it's going to be a war, then he has to go to the hole until a, a, a Hispanic cell open up. It's that serious. It's that serious, yeah. Now you've never been affiliated with anybody. No. You said you looked up to Tuki when you were uh, when you were younger. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I looked up to a lot of a lot of the guys. You yeah. Know? But you you were never a crip or blood. No. Nah. Anything else like that. Mm -hmm. And I guess when you got to prison, um, you were really the the pacifier in most situations where if mm -hmm. things started. Mm -hmm. Well, you said how I think I remember an interview basically saying like. If you were playing basketball with somebody and somebody felt like they, you know, they got fouled or whatever, and they wanted to fight you, you'd be the one to try to calm down the situation as opposed to like oh, yeah, escalating. If, if it related to me, right? You know, I usually don't get in other people's business. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if, okay, if, that, if, that's what you mean by if yeah. it relates to me, then then I don't want, you know, like the Hoover Crips claim me hmm. as a Hoover Crip. Okay. So. Uh, If I have them, something happens to me in jail, then they feel that it's their duty to take up my issues. If I'm saying it right. Okay. Um, Even though you're not officially a Eagle of a Crip. Not at all. Yeah. And I tell them I'm not. You know. <laughs> uh, but you helped out a lot of them over the years, so. Absolutely, but I helped out 60s and, <laughs> and Bloods and you everybody. Know, and Putin is my man, you know. I mean, yeah. Putin was, was was super tight, you know. Um, the Freeway Task Force got Putin, you know. They put Putin was one of the guys who got out of prison uh, when 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 I got the Freeway Task Force indicted. Mm -hmm. So so that's not saying you know that because I helped the I probably helped more Hoovers out than I did anybody else, you know. But I knew more Hoovers, you know. But it wasn't it wasn't. Uh, because of their gang affiliation is the reason I helped them. That's not the reason. Just because you knew more of them. I knew more of them. Gotcha. So you never got caught up in any of the gang politics or anything else like no, that? No, no. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see the importance. I mean, you know, it was a time, like I said, that I wanted to be a Crip. Um, but it was short-lived. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you look at where we are right now. Do you know about the whole Takashi 6 9 situation? I heard about it. Well, Takashi got got arrested for, for RICO, you know, federal racketeering, gun charges, and so forth. Did you go in for RICO, or is it something else? No, they hit me, uh, I had, what I have before, uh, continuous criminal enterprise. Yeah. It's similar to the RICO. Uh, um, had me for that, 851, um, and conspiracy. Right, because RICO is, 
the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act. Yeah. That's what he got locked up for. Having over five people and making so much money and, and doing different crimes. Involved, he was involved allegedly in various crimes. They have photos and videos of him actually at the scene of the I crimes. Heard, they, they found items from the crimes on in him? his home. Yeah. At one point he, he says something on camera which looked like a hit. <laughs> You know, he he said, oh, you know, I got thirty bags on on this guy, and then sure enough, the guy gets shot at, like I think a day later or something wow. like that. Not to say that that's actually happened, but this is what they're trying to. Oh, well, they're gonna use that in court. They're gonna use all this stuff. That's what really, really, really trips me out about how people don't really um, uh, uh, pay attention to to like rap music when these guys are saying, "Oh, I sold three hundred kilos," and if it was any possibility that the government thought that he was actually selling kilos, they would use that saying 100%. in court. Your music, your interviews, they have his, his you know, Instagram live feeds, they have everything. They've never heard me say that on tape, that I sold kilos. Yeah. Never. But they still got you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the conversation that they played in court between me and Danilo was, um, I got him. How much? And that was our conversation. And that was enough to, to convince That was you. enough. Because well, the, fed, the feds when have... When Danilo come in, he says, uh, when they ask him, well, what are you talking about? You got them. Oh, I'm talking about kilos. Well, what is he saying when he asks you how much? Uh, he's asking how much a kilo. Mm. Well, the feds have, uh, I mean, I've seen different numbers. I've seen like 95, 97, 93, but it's always in the 90s. Conviction rate? Conviction rate, yeah. No, 98. 98% conviction rate. When you look at this case. Katachi? Yeah, Takashi. He's done. He's done. You don't see him getting out. Take a deal. Take a deal. Well, you know, uh, uh, when Meech was going to court, uh, you know, Meech was right me. Really? Yeah. And what was he saying? What, what should I do? How should I handle it? Mm. And when he hit me and told me that they offered him 30 years, and um, I told him I would take it. You told him to take that 30 years? Yeah. Okay. I told him I would take 30 years. You know, yeah. uh, I would have willing to take 20 on my case. I interviewed his son, uh, Big Meech's son. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been around Big Meech before. I've been at his house and you know, at the height of BMF, they flew me out to, you know, because I was a DJ and they, you know, they were fans of my mixtapes. And you know, I guess the way he described it was by taking this deal, he still had a chance to get out at some point. Absolutely. You know, the laws would change, there's appeals. Well, when you take a plea deal, there's no appeals, right? No appeal. Right, but there's, the laws could change, you still could do something. You can do 30 years. They got people done 30. You yeah. know, I have a, I have a childhood I mean, friend. Little D, <laughs> did almost 30. Did 30. 30. Yeah. You know, I had a childhood friend who just got out 34 years, you know, uh, so, so you can do 30. Yeah. But a life sentence, like right now, I got a friend uh, Mr. Walls from, from, from Detroit, and um, he was tied into Young Boys Incorporated, and he had 34 years at one time, and he appealed to 34 years, and they turned around and gave him a life sentence. Hmm. If he had the 34 years, he'd be out right he'd now. He'd be out right now. Yeah, no, I've heard of cases where people get one year to life, and 20 years later, they're still there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Fed's life is, is life. It's no, no 20 to life, 30 to life. Oh, it's just life. No. What they was going to get Meech was life. Okay. So he couldn't have did 30 years and then come up for parole. It wouldn't have been that. Uh, my case was a life without the possibility of parole. So uh, it was no possibility of, you know, a law changing or, or none of that. None of that was going to happen. Okay. As this case is, you know, coming together, you know, the, one of the guys that, that got arrested with, uh, with Takashi, uh, Shadi, who was kind of like the head of, you know, the Treyway label, mm -hmm. uh, I guess told the judge, we don't fold, we don't bend, we don't break. It's Treyway. Hmm. That's good. If they don't. Uh, when, we, when we used to sit in M, 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 M uh, and, you know, you would be going to court, and the court is where they would bring all the people in. Mm -hmm. You know, through the through the holding through the holding cells, and they would take them back and fingerprint them. And and when we would be sitting in there, we would see five or six people come in, and you know, the talk in the in the cell would be, "Who's gonna break first? 
because somebody's going to break. You know, if you got five or ten guys, one or two guys in that organization is going to break. So he's basically saying that none of us are going to break. Some of them are going to break. Someone's going to break. Yeah, I would. I would probably Takashi. I would break. I would bet everything that I got on it that that one of them's going to break. Really? Yeah. And once. How one, many guys on that case? I personally know of. I mean, including Takashi, I know of four. You guys are saying more? Eight. eight people. If they got eight people, I'll bet that two of them are going to tell. Okay. I'd be willing to pe- place a bet. I don't gamble either. <laughs> <laughs> but you would bet on this. I bet that two of them are going to tell. <laughs> two people is going to, because, uh, you know, you start talking to people about, and, and then you figure these are lower level guys and they probably didn't make much money. You know, uh, you start talking about 40 years, 30 years, and, you know, and the prosecutor talking about, well, we can get you out of here in two or three. Mm. Sounds pretty appealing. Absolutely. I remember... Uh Lil D told me that when they when they arrested him, and he had a baby that I guess was born a couple of weeks after he got arrested, um, they offered to take him, his girlfriend, and his baby and put him in protective custody. Uh, no, put him in um, what do you call that? Not protective custody. Um, witness, witness protection. Yeah, they offered to put him in witness protection, move him to like Idaho somewhere, change his name, and so forth. He said no. Uh, he said we got the drug ledgers right. We see all these guys that's doing business with you, right? We want these guys over here, right? Help us get these guys. We'll change your name. We'll put you in protective witness program. We'll, we'll, whoever you want to go with, you can go. And you might do five years. And I said to them, man, I can't, I can't, there's no way I can help you with that offer you just said, you know? Yeah, but now you don't even, I mean, they let guys walk around, you know. Um, I mean, you know, we talked about the guy on, on your show, and the guy called me one day. Which guy? The informant. Which informant? The super informant. You know what I mean? Me telling you about this. Is, it's a super informant out. This guy is like the biggest, he was like DEA's number two weapon, the number three weapon in, in, in the war on drugs. A guy by the name of Andrew Chambers from, from St. Louis. Okay. I, I told you about him before, and he called me after I did your show. Okay, so and how, how, what's your relation to Andrew Chambers? He told on you? No, he, he, he tried to get me out. He missed me. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy because he got, um, he got a few of my friends, Hootie, uh, Hootie Fuller out of Long Beach, uh, okay. Snoop's wife's brother. Oh, okay. He got Chubb from Grape Street, uh, Chauncey. I mean, he cleaned L.A. up. He had like 20 guys, knocked them off. Hemmed them all up. Yeah. Got told, told on everybody. Everybody. So, and, he, and he called you? From your show. He saw your show. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Not through me, by the way. I, no, I don't know, no, I don't no, know no. who this guy is. Like, let, me, let me just put that <laughs> no, out there. I, that's, just to, <laughs> that's just to reach out your show. Right. Okay. So he reached out. Like, so so I'm, riding, I'm riding down the street one day, right? And I get, a, I get a private call. I take all my calls. Yeah. You know, because somebody owed me $10 million. And mm-hmm. I'm waiting on them to call me. So I get this private call. And uh, I was like, Hello? And he was like, hey, what's up? And I was like, oh, not much. Who is this? He was like, this is the informant. <laughs> I was like, the informant? <laughs> he said, yeah, the informant, the one you was talking about. Okay. And I was like, Andrew Chambers? He was like, yeah, this is Andrew Chambers. He was like, man, I want to do some speaking engagements with you. <laughs> what's he going to say? I said, listen, man. I said, listen, man. Some of my partners want to kill you. <laughs> oh, but it was it was crazy. It was a crazy conversation. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, you don't have to be in witness protection no more. You know, these guys they just let the people just walk around. You know, and 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 be untold on everybody. Wow. You know, they be. Um, I mean, you know, the word is. It is like uh, he didn't tell on me, huh. so I ain't finna ruin my life because he told on somebody else. Yeah. And 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 really, that's logical thinking. I mean, if somebody wanted me to go and ruin my life because my partner was selling drugs, enjoyed it, had a great time, 
And when the consequences come, because telling is part of the consequences, you know, that's how we all go to prison. Somebody tell on us. Uh, and he wants me to go and take care of the guy that told on him. No. Don't even think about it. Yeah. Go handle that yourself. Right. Or you get somebody else to handle it. I'm not going to ruin my life, you know, uh, uh, for nobody else. Yeah. I mean, this almost reminds me of, you know, and I have these conversations a lot of times with, you know, some of the younger, younger kids I, I interview on the show of how some people will refuse to call the police for any reason whatsoever. And, and I would bring up the story of, let's just say somebody, you know, a serial, serial killer killed your mother. Would you call the police on them? And a lot of them will say no. And they would say, no, I, I, would, I would handle it myself. Yeah, that's crazy. And, and, and you understand emotionally why someone would do that, but you're now creating a cycle. Okay, so now you go commit murder, and you know you you know you and your friends will find it justified, but the law is not going to find it. You, you're still going to go to jail for murder. Right. So now you're creating a revolving door into the prison system because you refuse to let the police. Well, you know, do I had a job. friend. His daughter got kidnapped, and um, he was wrestling with a similar situation. Hmm. You know, should I pay the ransom? Uh, should I call the police? What should I do? And um, you know, luckily he made the right decision. He called the FBI. And, you know, two or three hours later, they had his daughter back. Mm. You know, they uh, was able to find other guys from the phone booth they was calling from. So, you know, uh, and, and, and everybody has their own thinking, you know. Uh, me, myself, I don't believe that you're a snitch. Uh, if you're an old lady and somebody do something to you, you call the police. Right. So you would call the police if, um, it, was a, if it was an appropriate situation? Uh, I don't know if I would necessarily call the police because um, nobody really do anything to me. You know, I'm, I'm, in, a, I'm in a position where, where nothing really happens to me, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, if you're, but like, let's say your house got robbed or your business got robbed. I don't think I would, I don't think I would call the police if they robbed my business. Okay. You know, um, I try to put my business in a position not to be robbed, you know, where, where it's almost rob proof. Um, and, and most guys who do that stuff, you know, they prey on the weak. You know, they don't really do things to uh, people that can defend themselves, where it's going to be a, a, um, a confrontation. Right. You know, it's mostly uh, done against people who, who, who are weak and, and, and vulnerable. And, you know, I try not to be weak and vulnerable right. at all times. El Chapo is on trial right now. Um. Last I checked, they haven't been able to find a single dollar of this drug money that, you know, they claim that, that he, he had has. The billions? <laughs> the, the billions. And his wife actually did an interview recently yeah. on, like, on Telemundo, I think, where she claimed that she is, had not seen anything illegal that he's done at all. And this whole thing <laughs> is, a, is a fabrication to, to bring down, you know, this great man that, that's been married to her. Um, he's done, though. You think he's done? Oh, yeah. you never see. Forget it. Sometimes I wonder how just a regular working guy was able to get these tunnels. <laughs> Remember when he was in the Mexican prison? Yeah. A million dollar tunnel? A million dollar tunnel. Yeah. I don't see it either. But I, I, it, don't, it don't matter anyway. You know, his, his situation is so, um, so big that even if they violated his civil rights, they're going to override him. Yeah, he's never going to see light again. No, he never will. Do you think that locking up El Chapo really does anything in terms of the, the, drug, no. the drug operations between Mexico and, and the U.S. and so forth? Absolutely not. Somebody was waiting for El Chapo to go to prison, you know, uh, to take his place. And maybe it might create five more. You know, it might be five little guys who were, um, you know, in the wings, getting very little pieces, but now they're getting greater pieces, which will eventually uh, bubble up to be, you know, the next one. I mean, when you were, when you were dealing, Colombia was pretty much supplying the world with cocaine. Yeah. Right? With mm -hmm. um, Pablo Escobar. 
Yep, and the Ochoa's and the Medellin. Yeah. But then at one point it moved into Mexico. It seems like Mexico kind of took over. Yeah, we believe that the Mexico Mexico took over after um, after Escobar. The was black killed? guy started robbing all the Colombians. Really? Yeah, yeah. We started hearing in prison that uh, different people were getting robbed, and and um, they eventually handed over, you know, to a different sector of the other community. So that's how the Mexicans came in. Yep. And they were pretty much a little more ruthless. Where they they weren't getting robbed as much, or I don't know if 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 more ruthless. Um, <laughs> Colombians were pretty ruthless, especially Escobar. Yeah, yeah. What well, they say Escobar was. Uh, Escobar was killing. Politicians, well, you know, like, and when they hear in the U.S. though, they kind of like out of their their element somewhat. You know, especially when when they start dealing with the gang members. You know, from South Central L.A. You know. Um, Kind of like right now, you know, where the rappers say, Rob, you connect, you know, most yeah. people wasn't ready, you know. Um, they weren't ready for you to be, you know, to be robbing them. The same people they're selling the drugs to would now become the robber, you know, it's, it's kind of throws you off a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that was actually my introduction to the drug game. I, I did a deal with somebody and he robbed me. Hmm. That, was, that was the end of my drug, my drug career. Because, in fact, I just interviewed Bill Duke, who did... Um, um, deep cover and I told him that movie inspired me to sell drugs you directed one of my all-time favorite movies deep cover thank you thank you I had no idea all these years I, I've, I've been such a mega fan of that movie I, I'll be honest I, I've said this before I actually got inspired I mean not in a good way obviously but in a I actually got inspired to uh, to actually mess around with, with drug dealing after watching that movie. Wow. Wow. Watching that movie, I had a friend that was involved in some street shit, and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm, I'll be the, the white business guy, and he's the, the street guy, and I'm going to do the deep cover thing. And he ripped me off right away, and uh, I lost a bunch of money, and that was the end of my drug dealing career. But well, <laughs> I understand. It was, uh, it gave, the movie gave insight, but you know it was based on a book. Yeah, I heard about that. <laughs> and it was literally a one and done. Yeah. You know, and I freely admit it. Like, you know what I'm saying? The guy came in, I put up the money, and he basically robbed me, and that was the end of that. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it definitely uh, is ruthless, you yeah. know? And in retrospect, I'm kind of glad that it happened. Yeah. Because had, had this not happened and I somehow got more deeply involved in it. I would have went to prison. Yeah, I probably would have went to prison. Yeah. No, I, was, no. I was able to just walk away with losing some money and, yeah. you know, yeah. not, not it's, dealing. It's worse when you do good. Yeah, it's worse than when you do good. When you do good, it's, yeah. it's worse because then you get that mentality that this is the way it is and this is yeah. the way it's going to be. And, 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 and it, was, it was a very, and I, and I remember when it happened, it was like, it, it was a very interesting kind of thought pattern that went in. It's like, well, I can't call the police. I have to somehow handle this through violence in order to somehow fix this. And, and I, I was and, not And that's the bad part about being yeah. a drug dealer, too, yeah. is because the robbers know that. Yeah. They know you can't call the police, you know, and, and that kind of puts you in a, a really vulnerable situation, you know. Puts everyone in a vulnerable situation. It does. If you are willing to do that violence, then now, yeah. It takes your crime to a whole nother level. It takes it to a whole different level. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Because the violence is what kind of triggers the police, you know, you get on the police radar. If everyone quietly sold drugs and no one got and, and, killed. And, 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 you know, and that's usually how most drug, most successful drug dealers carry it, uh, even though, um, they like to portray a, a different a different scenario. You know what happened is that the, the Colombians had got used to doing business with a certain group of blacks, but then when those guys were gone, now they're looking for the next guy, and now they're dealing with guys who are really robbers and and and, and, yeah. and gangbangers, and it's a different. It's they a they different. were just used to robbing people. That was, that was their exactly. Yeah, yeah like, like Trey D. He said he did not have the patience to sit in a trap house all day. Why the robbery over, over the dope dealing? Because it seemed like the dope dealing is easier. I didn't have patience. Hmm. I didn't have patience. You, you just wanted quick. I just, and not only that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a sit still kind of person. It's hard for me to like, you know, just, you know, not be mobile and involved and, you know, interact. So just sitting up and, and I'm not a, you know, a gamer or nothing like that. So. 
you know, I'm and sitting here, it was like, to me, sitting inside of a dope house, waiting on the police to come kick the door in, or waiting on somebody like me to come <laughs> kick the door in and get it, you know what I'm saying? It was like, yeah. you know, I, that's too much tension, you know what I mean? So I just didn't really take to that lifestyle. Right, <laughs> and, it, and, and for a lot of people, you know, I, yeah. I, I've known a whole bunch of guys that get out of prison and, and, and that becomes their mission. Well, I'll just rob drug dealers. Yeah, you know, so who so. are they gonna go to? Right. You know? Yeah, man, but uh, El Chapo's done, huh? Yeah, yeah, he's done, you know. Um, he'll never see uh, the streets again. Yeah. Straight to ADX. Yeah, and he, and what's actually kind of funny about the whole situation is that he got caught because of an interview with Sean Penn. <laughs> I saw the whole thing. I you watch know, the news now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, What was the model that got him? Yeah. He wanted the model. Yeah, but he was basically, yeah, he agreed to do an interview while on the run from escaping from a maximum security prison. How crazy You know, is that? he could have potentially... Still be free. Still be free right now. Get some plastic surgery. You know, he had enough, more than enough money to do whatever he wanted. He could be chilling. But he probably right now. was, you know, was was a kid from Mexico who had never been nowhere, and, and yeah. you know, just uh, found a pipeline, you know, and and started filling the pipe up, you know. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, look next how thing long. you know, he's making millions, but just because you make millions, don't mean that 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 you know anything. Money don't make you smart. Yeah. I mean, look at Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. So. uh... So Freeway, you actually brought an artist that you're working with. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm still fulfilling that prophecy that I did when I was in prison with that life sentence. Um, getting into the music business. Uh, you know, I, I done dipped in it a few times, but uh, I haven't had the success that I know that I can. Right, because I think, uh, probably mentioned this last time, uh, was it J-Row from the Alcoholics? Yep. Was signed to you back <laughs> in the day? Well, they should have been signed to me. We didn't, we didn't finish the contract. Uh, yeah. But I was the one that, that got them to uh, uh, Ken Rifkin. Uh, Steve Rifkin. Steve Rifkin. Rifkin, yeah. <laughs> um, but you got a new guy here, Naku. Yes, sir. Okay, how'd you guys link up? Shoot, we linked up through Hayes, for real, for real. Um, I came out here in LA a couple months ago, actually, for the first time. I ain't never been on the West Coast at all, straight from the East Coast. I didn't know nothing was going to go on. I just came out here off of faith, for real. And I came over here. I linked up with uh, somebody from my city. His name is Hayes, and okay. he hit me up. Uh, what city is that? York, Pennsylvania. Okay. That's like an hour, 45 minutes from Philly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I came out here at Cali and stuff. I seen him, I was like, oh yeah, I'm out here, let's link up. He's like, where? He knew I was on my music stuff heavy, grinding and stuff, so he was like, I got a show for you. We gonna put you on a show. So I came out here, I didn't even know my man Rick Ross was gonna be in here, Freeway Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know he was gonna be there, so when he showed up, I was like, oh, it's lit. So I had to just put on a good show and they was just rocking with me from there. Okay. And what was it about him that made you? Uh, well, you know, I, I I said that I wasn't going to really get into the music business until I got my money up. You know, uh, it was so much fake stuff going on in the music industry that that uh, I just kind of like got fed up with it. And I just so I was just going to wait until I got my money up. And then Hayes had hit me up and he was like, man, you got to listen to this kid, man. He the one. And I was like, ah, I really don't want to listen to no music. I get like. 40 texts every day with somebody, they the ones, you know? Right. <laughs> and um, finally Hayes got me to listen to the music. I think we might have been, I don't know what city we was in. We was in Chicago, we riding in the car in Chicago. And, and like, I don't even listen to music, you know? Uh, and so Hayes was able to, to put the music on the radio and then I started to listen to it and I was like, dang, this kid, dude, he got something, he's different. You know, he ain't like, you know, he ain't selling dope, he ain't gang banging. Uh, but he's making some good music, you know, and uh, I, I've been looking for that, you know, somebody that's um, not gang banging, that's not a drug dealer, that's not a hit man, uh, you know, but just can, can, can just take life and, and put it into a song, you know, and, and make it fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I feel that, that he brought to the table, and, and that's why I was willing to, uh, to bring him with me today. Okay. Um, 
so many other artists that that that's gonna be mad, you know, that was <laughs> around before you was around, and you know they're gonna say they did such and such for me, and uh, but at the end of the day, uh, they just didn't hit that chord that that I was looking for. Yeah, you want to sing a little something? <clears throat> Don't want to sing some? I got you. <clears throat> Let's see. I, I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna sing something original from you. Okay. All right. Uh, Girl, can you tell me what's been on your mind? Cause lately you just haven't been the same. Girl, I can sense that something's going on. Well, girl, can you let me know either way, baby? I'm trying to show you something real. Yeah. All right, that's what's up. That's what's up, man. Well, you know, I, I see a lot of uh, a lot of artists, you know, come come through over the, you know, many years, 15, 15 <laughs> plus years I've been in there, man. And uh, you know, all it takes is that one song. It takes that go. once once you hit that one song and, and it reacts, and you got you know all that work in the chamber. You know, it takes off very quickly. You know, but sometimes it takes a while. Yeah, I've been right doing song. music for a good nine years. Next year, we'll make my 10th year. And two years ago, stuff just started taking off. Like yeah. I dropped a song, and it went uh, viral on Facebook. It hit 17 million. Dope. With my man, Young Verse. Shout out to Young Verse. And uh, these last two years, I've been doing a lot East Coast-wise. Uh, went on tour with PNB Rock. We did like a, a five, six show tour. Okay, yeah, he's dope. Yeah, um, I dropped a song with Rich the Kid last year. Okay. Got a song with Lil Yachty out. Yeah, man. Well, listen. Keep grinding, man. Keep grinding. It's a process. You know. It sounds like you got the you got the ability. You got good people in your corner, man. You know. All it takes is just that one that one hit. That's just undeniable. And you know, we're we gonna be coming change. at them. They're gonna see. You know, it ain't gonna be like what Floyd said. When you see me, you're gonna see him. This is gonna be <laughs> real. When they see me, you know, they're gonna see him. We're gonna be. Uh, Hitting the road, you know, I'm gonna be on my book tour again mm -hmm. in a couple months when this new book come out, uh, riding with Rick. Uh, so he gonna ride with me, you know, cause a lot of times I go in the club, I can do whatever I wanna do in the club. So right. uh, we're gonna be spending his songs wherever we go and uh, and letting him get his performance on and, and just grind. We gonna grind our way in, you know. It's grind time. That's what it is, man. Well, Freeway Ricky Ross, not cool, man. Appreciate y'all coming through. No doubt. Till next Thank time. You. Peace.